Cloud-based technologies, in my opinion, fall into two categories. This is my opinion. There certainly would be companies that don't fall into these two categories, but generally, in my opinion. The first is technology companies that use machine learning to help them build their product quicker and deploy it quicker. So they use machine learning to you know, normalize the data and tag all the points and it allows them to build their product in three weeks rather than three months. So they're using technology to build something faster and get it out there quicker, which is great, that's good. The second group of companies are people that are trying to use machine learning as part of the actual product, as in you know, the energy efficiency or the optimization or whatever it is that they're doing they're using machine learning and artificial intelligence as part of that. The problem is what I have found, in, in my opinion, is that in most cases, what they're using their machine learning for, the code, is just reproducing what the BMS is already doing, which in my mind doesn't provide a lot of value. And I think this happened by accident because in Australia, I think that Australia is the most advanced country in the world around BMS, control strategy, optimization. And the reason why is more than 10 years ago, our commercial offices started to have energy efficiency ratings. We've discussed this at length in many videos. But in Australia, it's been worth our while for a long time to invest a lot of effort into optimizing our control strategies to save energy because if there was a demand for it, we could improve our energy efficiency ratings and building owners could earn higher rents. So owners were prepared to pay a lot of money to improve their energy efficiency rating. In other countries, I don't think that's been happening. So in a lot of big countries around the world, energy efficiency hasn't been a priority. So now that it's becoming a priority, you have these cloud-based technology companies and they're employing a BMS engineer, I guess, and a HVAC mechanical engineer to start building up stuff. And these BMS engineers are just thinking, well, okay, well, let's reset the air handling at supply temperature set point. Let's optimize that control loop. Let's reset the set point for the AHU's static pressure control. Let's do that. The thing is, in Australia, we've been doing that for over 10 years. It's well developed and, and well tuned and, and sort of optimized. So when these cloud-based technology companies in Australia deploy their machine learning stuff, they're basically taking an air handling unit supply pressure reset and running it in the cloud over the BMS built in already doing that. The same as they start to develop optimal start machine learning type strategies that just run over and duplicate the BMS optimal start code. So in some countries where you are not resetting every single set point automatically to meet the demand and optimize the loops, in those countries, that probably is useful. But why don't we rather use machine learning to build things that we cannot do in the BMS? That would be very useful. So in today's video, I'm gonna give you an example of what I wish the machine learning cloud-based technology companies would use their data scientists people to build stuff that we can't do. And that would provide a lot of value to building owners and it would close the gap for what we can't do. And that $30,000 a year annual subscription service that we're paying for cloud-based technologies would be really valuable because it's not valuable when it's just doing exactly what the BMS can do itself and in Australia is already doing. Before we start, I'm gonna run through this very quickly. The purpose is not to teach you how this actually works, but to convince you of the concept of what just might be possible and how huge the gap is between what the technology companies are currently building and what we desperately need them to be building.
So here we have a pretty standard variable volume air handler unit. We have our heating and cooling valves controlling temperature and our fan controlling static pressure. And we have our VAV boxes with our zone temperature sensors. Now in Australia, in every single building, we reset the static pressure set point dependent on the demand from the field. And we reset the air handler unit supply temperature on demand from the field. So we are already optimizing these two control loops as standard practice in building management systems. So the first part of optimization is to get these two set points optimized for the, for the load. But where it gets interesting is that with the supply air temperature set point, if you drop the supply air temperature set point just slightly, what happens is the cooling valve opens a little bit and colder air goes through the air handling unit, down the riser, and that cooler air goes through all the VAV boxes, and that cooler area, that cooler air drifts onto the temperature sensors, and the temperature starts to read slightly lower. It just drops 0.1 degrees Celsius, 0.2 degrees Celsius, 0.3 degrees Celsius. And as that temperature starts to slightly drop from the cooler supply air, all the VAV dampers start to slightly back off a little. So if that VAV damper was at 60%, or say all of them were about 60%, then that slightly, that two degrees Celsius colder air would create, cause all these dampers to close off just a little bit, say 10%. When that happens, the duct pressure goes up slightly and the supply fan slows down. So there is an indirect relationship between the supply air temperature and the speed of the fan. Most people don't realize that. So there's a reasonably complex control strategy around trying to manipulate the speed of response of the supply air temperature reset against the supply air pressure reset to try and slightly bias a slightly cooler air which results in the fan slowing down. So by manipulating our control strategy and through our energy efficiency optimization tuning, we can get all of our air units fans to slow down slightly by reducing the supply air temperature slightly. The problem we have is that obviously as we drop this air handling at supply temperature down slightly, obviously the cooling valve opens and all these AHU cooling valves open a little bit more. And as that happens, the chilled water pipe pressure drops and the variable speed drives on the chilled water pumps speed up. So as we're optimizing this system and saving fan energy, there is a negative impact somewhere else in a different plant room that we're not looking at because it's resulting in our chill water pumps speed increasing and using more pumping power to get more chill water around here. So just put that in your head for a second or put that to, to one side for a second. The other thing that we do is we have an optimization strategy where we increase the chiller's temperature slightly. So when we increase the chiller's supply water temperature slightly, what happens is the chiller's COP increases. The coefficient of performance of the chiller increases as we slightly increase this temperature. So we have reset strategies that slightly do this, and we get a saving here as this, the COP, the efficiency of the chiller increases. Now again what happens is as we do that, slightly warmer temperature comes through the chill water system, that warmer temperature comes through here, there's less cooling capacity available to us, and this temperature comes up a little bit, the cooling valve opens to compensate, and the speed drive increases to make up for more pressure. So where this, this optimization strategy here negatively impacts on the pumps, the same thing happens is as we optimize the chiller's COP, it negatively impacts on the pumps. So just put that to one side as well for a second. Let me move this out of the way. That's not gonna work.
So here we have two cooling towers providing heat rejection for the chiller's condenser. So we already have control strategies where we actively reduce the condenser water temperature. And as we reduce this condenser water temperature, that cooler water goes through the chiller's condenser and that makes the chiller more energy efficient and the chiller's COP goes up. So as we're looking at wet bulb temperature, etc., etc., we do some things and we reduce the condenser water temperature automatically through an optimized control strategy and that makes the chiller more energy efficient. But obviously, as we reduce the condenser water temperature to make the chiller more energy efficient, we have to run the cooling tower fans harder. So as we're seeing improvements here in our optimization, we're having we're drawing more power through our fans here. I think there's been videos last year where we've discussed this circuit and this circuit, how these two optimization strategies work. But the point being again, we're optimizing something here and on the roof plant room, we're not noticing that the fans are running harder to achieve that optimization strategy. What we sometimes do not very often is, um, if the chiller is running at full capacity, say it's running at 1000 kilowatts of refrigerant, it's running at full design capacity. We've got to run the pump at full design volume to reject the design, you know, reject all the heat for the chiller to work properly. But if the chiller is running at say 50% capacity, we probably don't really need to run this pump at full design volume because the chiller is not running flat out. So occasionally we have an optimized control strategy where as the chiller's capacity is reducing, there's less load out here. We slow this pump down just a tiny bit, not a lot. You know, maybe we'd slow it down, you know, just 10%. So we can save on energy on our condenser water pumps if our chillers don't need full design heat rejection. Again, the negative impact is that as this pump slows down, we have less volume of water through the condenser and there's less heat rejection, so it probably affects the COP of the chiller as well. The bottom line here is, and, and here's the point of the video, every single one of these multiple optimization strategies in isolation save energy, tick in the box, let's do high fives. But almost always, when you optimize one system, it almost always negatively impacts some other system somewhere else. Now, us as human beings, and with our current BMS control strategies, which we've been implementing in Australia for 10 years, we are good at optimizing all these different control strategies. We can optimize all these things. We can optimize the air handling unit. We can optimize the chill water system. And we can optimize the condenser water system. But what we cannot do is we don't have the ability to understand the performance of all the other interacting systems dynamically all at the same time. So we can do the air handle units, we can do the chillers, but this where all the systems interact with each other, that is where we need the machine learning and the artificial intelligence. Because we as human beings can't do this. We can't sit here and optimize this strategy and understand two or three other places where they're all connecting and affecting each other. All right, that was, I'll be honest, that was pretty tricky. Um, I found that quite difficult to get that out of my head onto a piece of paper. When I record these videos, like the, the intro, the introduction part of the video, I could record that 10 times to get it sort of right. But if I'm drawing something, I can't draw that five times. So whenever you see me draw something, you just get whatever I draw on the first go. So I apologize if I made a few mistakes and I said water instead of air or open instead of close or up or down, whatever it is. I'm pretty sure that you would all get the intent of what I'm talking about. So why does this happen? Why do we have this disconnect? 
And the reason why is because, in my opinion, everything's in my opinion, um, the technology companies and the building automation companies are working in isolation of each other. In fact, they're enemies. They don't want to work together. Because what's happening, whether it's intentional or not, the technology companies, their priority is to try and make the BMS company look as bad as possible. If they can find so many faults and so many you know, poorly performing systems, then technology companies can make the BMS companies look bad and therefore make themselves look good. And then maybe their customer will like, wow, you guys are amazing. You found a hundred faults in the first month of us turning on your machine. So you guys are great. Let's distribute your technology across our entire portfolio. So that's what's happening. The BMS companies are trying to defend their position for a start. And secondly, the BMS companies are annoyed that the customer didn't buy their technology, their, their own incumbent analytics package, and the owner bought a cloud-based package. So the BMS guys are annoyed anyway about that. And it's creating this divide between the two systems. But the problem is, and this is so key, is we're not going to proceed any further working in isolation of each other. Because in the BMS industry, at least in Australia, I feel like we have hit the ceiling of what we can achieve through control strategy optimization. We are doing all these good things. We've We've been testing for a very long time. We have all the settings and the parameters that we can tweak to optimize this system and that system and all these sort of things. And just keep in mind that we've spoken about the AHU's temperature set point reset, the AHU's pressure set point reset, the chiller's supply temperature reset, and the cooling tower temperature set point. There's a lot of other things that are going on that we haven't spoken about. So that was very complicated. It's much more complicated than that. So the first problem is as humans in the BMS industry, we can't crunch all that. We can't optimize these systems and watch all those other systems in real time. We just cannot do that. Secondly, The BMS service technicians, our BMS annual maintenance contracts, they say that we're gonna charge the building owner $50,000 a year to walk around and look for broken things and then charge our customers more money to fix those broken things. So in the BMS industry, we can't move forward with energy efficiency more than we currently are in Australia. Other countries, you probably have lots of catching up to do. So that's our problem. The technologies companies, what your problem is this, and I don't think you guys have realized this. The effectiveness of cloud-based technologies, how well it works, is completely reliant on the proactive collaboration of the incumbent BMS company. So while you technology guys are beating up the BMS company and making yourself look awesome, you need these guys to make you look good actually, because you can spit out a hundred faults. If the BMS company drags their heels because they're annoyed with you, your system isn't going to be successful. I think that like, you know, most BMS companies, okay, let's say half the BMS companies do not actively, proactively engage with a third party technology. Some companies do, some server technicians do their thing, they work hard, but usually the BMS companies aren't because we are completely unaligned. We need to start working together. Cloud-based technologies, we need to work together with the BMS companies. Now make no mistake, I'm not proposing or suggesting that the BMS companies are um, not a, a problem in this puzzle. Because to be honest, as we've discussed thousands of times, I have this saying, which I only say sometimes. I've almost said it before in videos, but I've always stopped myself the last minute, but I've had t too much coffee today. BMS companies.
I'm sorry I said that, but like we if but the analytics companies we need to work together. We are not going to get any further if we don't start working together. Cloud-based technology companies, machine learning, data scientist stuff people, we need you to stop wasting your time on fault detection. We've done that for five years. We need you to start building the machine learning to deal with the stuff that we as humans and the BMS industry cannot do ourselves.